Um, some of you were here for my presentation in the fall on leadership, lessons um, I had learned um, uh, along the road. Um, uh, today we <coughs> turn the tables. Um, uh, as you uh, prepare to conclude your terms of service, um, um, I thought it would be uh, valuable for, for all of us uh, to um, hear from you your perspectives on leadership. Um, uh, what you learned um, uh, along the way, what advice uh, you will have for uh, those who will uh, follow you. Um, uh, you, of course, represent the uh, whole range of um, uh, leadership and service that uh, this school is known for. Um, uh, uh, the ambassadors, SGA, um, uh, PSO, uh, just going through the list um, made me proud to be here at this school and proud of all of you. Um, so there's no hierarchy here. Um, I'm going to just toss out a few questions, and uh, uh, you don't all have to comment on each one because we only have a little less than an hour now. Um, uh, I guess I would start by saying, uh, what were your, your most important learning experiences um, uh, as organi organizational uh, leaders here at the school? I mean, um, what, what do you leave with that is most important to you that you didn't have um, uh, when you moved into these positions? I can begin. <clears throat> I would definitely say I've left with more experience in delegation. I used to be the one that always took on a lot and said yes, but I was doing it alone. And being the executive chairwoman of PSO, um, you know, I had treasurers, second vice chair, vice chair underneath me, and just giving them that responsibility and trusting them with it. It was hard in the beginning, but once I got to know my team and really understand their personalities and know that they are responsible, um, I'm a team of women, so responsible young women, they did a great job, and that's why I was like super happy that I was able to take on, you know, the role that I had and learn that delegation is really important to being a strong leader. You know, mine is actually uh, related to Gammy's, and uh, the Alexander Hamilton Society was startup this year. And so one of the biggest uh, lessons I learned is that in order to delegate efficiently, you have to understand the strengths of others and be able to effectively choose what tasks to let them take on or to give them and know when to push people and, and when to say, I think you might have a little too much on your plate too. Uh, and that was a really important aspect of what we were doing with the Alexander Hamilton Society. I think something else to take out of that is gratitude for other people. They're, these students are giving, they're, these are volunteer hours, they're voluntary members, they're not getting anything out of it, except for experience and great memories. So thanking your members and ensuring that they realize <coughs> that you really appreciate their work is very, very important. And I had to realize that, you know, coming into grad school as a first year, I now have different time constraints than I've had in other leadership positions in undergrad, and that my peers also have the same time constraints that I do. So managing time a lot more wisely, a lot more effectively, was something I had to learn that I really struggled with at first. I said in addition to, to Amber's point and Kristen's point about um, Alexander Hamilton Society, Ambassadors is only two years old, um, and any time an organization, an institution, a department, or that's state, local, federal, private, public, whatever, creates a new department, new agency that tends to tackle capacity issues with knowing your roles, your obligations, which feet um, to not step on, which, which voices to be heard. And so as ambassadors are being only two years old, we kind of still finding our identity within the school. And so we have to be careful to discern where our boundaries are, where they're not, and where our capacity really lies, uh, especially as I'm going into uh, we're all going to careers um, in different parts of the public or private sector. When you create new departments and new agencies for new initiatives, you have to be careful to hear all the different voices, know your capacity, and work with those two to be able to make sure you don't step on everybody's toes.
Any other thoughts? Any I don't know. Um, you have absorbed, in, in my experience, some very, very important lessons. Um, um, you know, leadership uh, can never be about um, you as the star turn. Um, uh, it's you uh, developing the abilities of others, delegating, uh, of expressing appreciation, um, and again for the ambassadors and the um, uh, Alexander Hamilton Society, uh, startups are tough. Um, uh, uh, there is kind of a blueprint for a H A H S S, uh, but um, you know the ambassadors had to write their own uh, their own playbook. And um, having worked with you on a number of occasions, you did it. You and your colleagues did it very, very well. Um, um, so what was the hardest challenge you faced as leaders? I think I can go with this one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the public servant is, is not necessarily something that a lot of people put a lot of time into just because it is a school newspaper. It is a completely student-led student published newspaper. And it's sometimes really hard to get content. We're all so very busy, especially with classes and organizations and, you know, trying to have a little bit of a social life if we can. Um, <laughs> so trying to get participation was one of the hardest parts. But I feel like once you start building connections with your classmates, your peers, and you start to realize where their interests lie, what they like to write about, or who are the greatest writers, I think trying to get past those weaknesses, it gets a lot easier. So I feel like that was one of the hardest things for public servant to get participation, but I think it's been a pretty pretty good year. <laughs> and again, mine is uh, exactly opposite. Uh, we had too many cooks in the kitchen at some points. Um, the Alexander <laughs> Hamilton Society was very lucky to have an extraordinary amount of uh, first year participation and it was wonderful and heartwarming and really inspiring but then when it comes time to make decisions and, and really implement different plans when you have uh, 45 50 people involved in one organization it gets difficult uh, because you want everybody to be involved but sometimes you you have to limit you know how many people can do one task because you end up slowing yourself down so it's actually an interesting dichotomy there <laughs> One of the uh, more difficult things for me to figure out, because it was difficult, I think, to transition when Grace had left, how you express what the relationship is like between the Bush School and the administration and the staff and student organizations, because we are supposed to be a separate entity, student-led organization. We have some wonderful advisors, but at the same time, we're supposed to be able to utilize some of the resources, like the communications department upstairs. And so <clears throat> it was hard to balance the level of support from them and then also the level of, of um, work that we were supposed to do as a team. So it was, a, it was a good learning experience. I think that's definitely something you can't really um, translate to somebody until they're in the role and having to communicate with all those um, staff members and administration because I think the priority is you come to school for academics and student organizations are you know the second priority if you're in this leadership role and so how do I take the time away from maybe Kimberly Reeves or Stephanie Bustos when I know that some of the more important things at the time are capstone or um, just scheduling rooms around that. So it was hard for me to recognize, oh, like, you know, maybe you can't get me a room last minute this week, you know, so how do you manage that relationship and say hi to them a lot and maybe I need to get, <laughs> <laughs> I need to get like a basket or something. And I think get a basket. Yeah, yeah, because they do a great job. So that's good. I think for me, and I totally agree with everything Amber said also, um, but also like taking the jump because we are a new organization and we had a lot of people out in the rain trying to promote our first event and then you know events things pop up like you try and check and, and look at all the other organizations that are having events or anything else but then like the 25th anniversary for the they had an event at the same time as one of ours and it wasn't posted on the internet so like we didn't know and then it was too late so taking that jump and just being like well we've done all we can and thank goodness it, it's worked out for us 
so far. I hope that next year it continues to. Um, but that was that was my hardest part, is because I'm I'm a planning type person. I I like to know. Oh yes, there will be 300 people at this event, and sometimes you you can't know that. You just do what you can and hope for the best. And on the topic of planning, one of the struggles I've had is realizing that I only have one year to make an impact. And while it, yeah. at the time it seems like that's a long time, it's really not. And so having to prioritize what I want to get done by the time my role as president of SGA ends has been a struggle because there's so many things you'd like to get done, but you have to admit to yourself that not all of it's going to happen. So what do you want to make sure happens? And that's kind of been a little bit of a struggle. I think that the biggest thing for me is and again, I can only speak for SGA, it's a unique organization in a unique position because it has such a broad mandate. I feel, you know, our sister organizations kind of have their niche areas in which they operate in. And so for me, and it's not necessarily a challenge, but something that I've learned in a transformation that, that's occurred in me during my time as former SJ president is that leadership is often more about what you don't do than what you actually do. Um, you have to be comfortable with, with yourself and you have to be comfortable that you're doing your job. And just to give a specific example, everything that you do as a leader is not necessarily going to be in the limelight or things that you can take credit for or put on a placard as an achievement. It's more about the behind the scenes work and I think you would kind of echo this sentiment. Uh, and again, only referencing SGA, when the copier's broken, you know, that's SGA. When we need new microwaves or something's wrong with the refrigerator, that's SGA. If there needs to be a lobbying effort to the administration, obviously that's SGA. And so <laughs> it's, it's, it's typically more about the behind the scenes uh, activities that really make the biggest impact and not necessarily something that you can articulate to students and you know wave a red banner that you're actually doing your job and so uh, for me it's always been important to think about again what you are not doing as opposed to what you're doing and then what you can take credit for as opposed to working behind the scenes to necessarily make an impact i um assume do not disabuse me of my fantasy if that's what it is you have um, succession plans and work uh, that you're working on, uh, uh, handoffs to uh, those who will uh, uh, lead in the future. Um, uh, what is the single thing that you wish you had known when you took these positions that that uh, your predecessors did not pass on. <laughs> I'll go ladies first on that one. <laughs> well, just we are, you know, especially Brandon can identify with a lot of this because we are mm -hmm. such a new organization. Uh, so I didn't necessarily have a predecessor, uh, but I mm -hmm. wish that I had been told that. Uh, the magnitude of having the Bush School name attached to what you do is actually very stressful. Uh, we had a lot of help from faculty, a lot of help from staff, and from our students. And that comes with a lot of pressure to perform well and to have you know, the very best product at the end, in our case, you know, different events or fundraisers or whatever it was, suddenly the Bush School name is attached to it. And with the legacy, that President Bush left behind, you know, that does begin to weigh on you as a student leader. And I had no idea that that was going to be such a stressor, uh, especially in the middle of a semester during midterms. <laughs> so that was a lot to handle. I think for the public servant, I wish I had been told that um, to not take it personally if some people don't like pieces in the public servant or the way that it's produced. It is a very, it, it turns out to be a hodgepodge of very different things because of, uh, because of the type of paper that it is. And sometimes when you hear, you know, oh, I didn't like what type of article this was, to not take it to heart and just assume that it's, it's only business, you know, everyone will have their own opinions and just move on with your daily, daily routine and just continue 
to just make a better paper, a better product, and take it as constructive criticism. It, it means that people are reading it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> which I like. <laughs> I would probably say two things um, in addition to what Amber was talking about. Um, so with respect to ambassador, so one thing that we do, um, I think really well is the fact that we um, are able to represent the Bush School in a variety of ways and a variety of functions. However, at those variety of functions, we deal with anybody from um, a representative school to someone that's a local college station Bryan resident, all the way up to our invited speaker or academic or practitioner or what have you. And being able to put an impact and hold the same value for the lowest person or the highest person in terms of just the, the nature of the event and anybody in between to put value in representing the Bush School to all those kinds of people. I wish um, someone would have told me that because there's definitely times where I've overlooked representing the Bush School to somebody that is just a, a Bryan College Station resident um, or, or an undergraduate student uh, that needs to know about 41's legacy that may have not been um, a special person at an event or one of our professors or something like that. The second thing I would say is the fact that um, to be always conscious, and I'll be very transparent about this, to be always conscious of our organization's activities on the effect it has on the rest of the Bushville students. Um, we had issues running last year and this year as well that I need to be more conscious of and how our events, our activities come across to other Bushville students and to always be uh, leading with humility in that and leading with a service heart rather than um, an entitlement, arrogance, or um, selectivity aspect to that. Um, so I, I wish that my predecessor would have told me that effect specifically how on Bush School students as well as being able to represent um, the Bush School for someone that's um, just coming to one of our events just to see a new speaker or the speaker itself. So. Um, I'd like to add that it's off of Brandon and Amber's point, but I think it's interesting to, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of the effects that now that all the student organizations have on each other, um, especially in relation to capacity and that we can't really spread our students too thin with the public service organization. We have a lot of events and we ask for time and labor from these students and it's at first, you know, we used to be able to manage that well and we had a long portfolio of organizations that we work with, but with the addition of the two new organizations, we realized that we actually had to, we decreased our portfolio of organizations and the events we're gonna do now because it was asking too much from all the students and we couldn't um, give, give that back to the organizations we were working with. So now I understand and I think it's better to kind of oversee what, how many people they have in their organizations and their commitment, like you said, I mean, if you're having 45 students there and they've you know, committed that time to, okay, that's all I can do and then the rest is gonna be academic work or, or work work um, where you get your paid, um, then I can't rely on those people to come in and do the volunteer work over the weekend. So it was hard to see that and, and we did notice it until we did make some changes off of that, so yeah. Well, and that was where, over the year, it, it developed uh, more than at the beginning. A lot of the inter or intra-student uh, leadership, you know, like communication, we had to learn to talk to each other and plan with each other rather than just depending on published uh, calendars. Mm -hmm. I know that there were a few times that we, you know, we had tried to find different, uh, different um, event times and we knew that there was a big event maybe on a Friday so we didn't want to have something the day before because even though it's on, not on the same day you have to factor in that everyone is planning their weeks around these different events and I think that you know for next year's class make sure you start those conversations early uh, because it's absolutely fundamental and that's something we've told our predator mm -hmm. or our successors uh, to really pay attention to because you know as a new organization you don't want to take away from something as important as PSO or as important as SGA you really don't um, and so that that was something we learned a little too late that I wish we had started in August yeah. along those same lines and um, I think it's really important we all also have learned and real Amber and I have really tried to encourage both each other and uh, the people in our organization to support all the other Bush School uh, student-led organizations like ambassadors if they have a fundraiser or PSO has a big thing going or a bake sale or something like that not only have we tried even though like we didn't really figure it out until maybe a little later to structure our events and our fundraisers around that but also encourage our participants hey we're not having anything go out and support the ambassadors at Jason's Deli they have a profit share going or there's going to be a bake sale like you should still come a little early before class and, and support that 
So I think that that's really important and will be as, as all of the organizations continue to grow to help them all flourish together. I think one thing that student leaders do need to understand is uh, in the beginning of the year, you will have a larger participation from mm -hmm the class, especially the incoming class, because everyone's very <laughs> excited to enter into these new organizations and, and you know, participate and get really excited and by, by mid-semester there will be a drop-off. So you should, you should definitely um, manage your groupings, your assignments with that it, um, and, and make sure you have a plan from the beginning of the semester, beginning of the year, before you, before you leave for the summer or right after you come back. Make sure you develop a plan or a mission to make sure that you're meeting all your goals and all your deadlines <coughs> to ensure that it's a it's a successful year. Can I add one more thing? I wish <laughs> I would have known how many emails I would get. <laughs> um, and it's, as a student leader, you're receiving emails from the main campus, and they want you to do things on the main campus, and they're like, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to actually interact with you know the student organizations over there or make an appearance over here and. It's really nice. I mean, it's great that they want to reach out to the Bushful and have like representative there, but you know, it's already like you're doing so much here. And I, I, it was really difficult to manage that. And then uh, along the same lines, you know, when things come up for the Bushful where they want an appearance, like us going to Maine, that was like a two week turnaround and it was like, drop everything, let's go to Maine. I was like, okay, I'm not turning that around or turning, turning that down, that's great. But you know, those things happen and it's like they want you there. And so you got to be able to jump on it and put some things aside. Um, you've touched on some number of very important points, um, including coordination um, uh, among the uh, uh, the different groups. Um, you touched on something I wanted to ask about, um, which is interaction outside the school, uh, elsewhere in the university. Uh, kind of got the sense that you, you found that uh, more of a burden than an opportunity. Um, um, but I'd be interested in um, uh, your reflections on the extent to which uh, you did interact with uh, uh, other campus organizations or, uh, or coordinate activities. Yeah, so I can give the example. We through we held the public service or, uh, forum. Public service forum. Okay, we held that in the fall, and it wasn't I don't know early spring, and it wasn't a great turnout. Uh, we were trying to get students here. Uh, we recruited to student organizations, departments for undergrads, and so there was some kind of disconnect. And I think there could be further um, looking into why there's disconnect and maybe it's because we're a graduate school and then the Bush School's name's tied to it but everyone was coming to the public service forum to learn about how to attend the Bush School and that's not what the purpose was the purpose was to instill um, public service and motivate people to enter this career and instead they were asking you know, how do I apply the Bush School stuff so I think that may be why I'm a little turned off by working with the on-campus organization <laughs> um, but it also didn't seem like the right fit whenever I was asked to communicate with um, these organizations and so it was public service forum and then I was being asked to it was during the student body elections I believe you know to en endorse them or I, I, I guess it just didn't make sense for the purpose of our organization to actually to do that and I believe SGA that's more of the role that they play maybe you want to hit on that kind of communication how that worked yeah and we did end up endorsing a Bush school candidate for student body president for SGA I thought that was a great opportunity and like I said I thought it was something that kind of fit SGA's role another thing that SGA has is we have two representatives on the graduate student council on main campus so those two individuals Trey's right here Trey's one of them he gets to you know once every two weeks gets to meet with other leaders on campus from other graduate programs and talk about issues affecting the entire campus and so it gives you kind of a broader perspective than just what's going on here in the Bush School and I uh, thankfully got to serve on it for a semester before going president so I got to see what that's like it's a great experience and so I'm glad we have that because we do at every meeting get an update from our graduate student council reps about what's going on on the you know the greater main campus so we are kind of we are connected in a sense we do have representation elsewhere so I'm glad we have that for us I know like since we're still a young organization, this doesn't really technically apply, but I guess she has a counterpart on main campus. PSO maybe has a counterpart on main campus. I'm not sure. 
public service may have a kind of part, maybe in town, but no, they don't have a kind of part on main campus. Um, separate. The counterpart on main campus for Ambassador would be somebody like the Maroon Coast, who does very similar activities. And so in the future, what I'll be telling our, our, um, our, our new exec team, our new council, would be to get involved with, to learn from the Maroon Coats, because they've been around for a long time, and they do exceptional work with donor relations and um, administrative relations at, on, the, on, the, on the main campus. And so uh, for us, it's a, it's a step forward to potentially have a relationship with them on main campus and to do some knowledge sharing and lessons learned uh, for an organization that does very similar things as ambassadors at the school. For AHS, um, our mission, uh, while, while we are Bush School led, we are actually a Texas A&M organization. Uh, so we have this sort of broader um, sort of purview of what we really expected to do. And uh, just speaking for Kristen and myself, we took it upon ourselves to make part of our mission to bring the gift of our Bush School faculty to the broader A&M mm -hmm. campus. Uh, we really, you know, we highlighted um, Dr. Lane and Dr. Norris uh, and brought in uh, Dr. Aaron Friedberg, who's from Princeton. And we made that um, an on campus, on main campus event so that we could, it, not only did it, um, you know, highlight the, the talent and scholarship that we have here at the Bush School, but it really, uh, from our point of view, we were able to make some sort of small difference in invigorating debate uh, for undergrads. And uh, as graduate students, that sort of seems like the right thing to do and uh, something that was really important to us. So we embraced working with main campus probably a little more than um, than some of the other organizations. So we had a little different perspective on working with main campus. It is hard though to echo Amber's point. Like we we are a registered uh, student organization on on Texas A and M more broadly than some of our counterparts here. But it's really difficult. We're over here at the Bush School. Amber and I are both incredibly busy, like we all are. We're, you know, capstone and everything this semester, particularly. So it's really difficult to to reach that connection and to reach out to these people and and have some of that knowledge sharing. And I mean, we we've done, I guess, well marginally. We have had undergrads attend our events and things like that. But we still don't have as much involvement as we want. So I know we've shared with our successors that we want to continue that outreach and, and get more integration uh, just because of what we are and we want to share what we have to offer as, a, as the Bush School and as the, an organization. Um, several of you have, have touched on this. I'd like to drill down a, a little more deeply. Um, uh, as you pointed out, uh, at the beginning, uh, you represent student-led, student-organized uh, uh, organizations. Um, uh, yet, uh, as you pointed out, we have a very, very talented, uh, uh, multifaceted faculty. Uh, uh, how do you feel about the? The level of interaction uh, uh, between your organizations, faculty, staff, and administration. Have we got the right mix here? Um, uh, too much involvement, too little? Um, uh, uh, just be interested in your thoughts as uh, 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 we consider how we can make this uh, the best possible experience for you and for your colleagues. Uh, again, recognizing that um, uh, uh, you're in charge. I mean, that's that's what this is about. Um, uh, and boy, have you been in charge. So. I think involvement from the faculty and staff is definitely encouraged. They know a lot more than we do and have a lot more expertise in, in the area that we're trying to get our graduate degrees in than, you know, we in, in very many years to come. Uh, we actually had an article from uh, Dr. Schriffenson in the public servant in, the, in mm -hmm. the last edition, so that was very nice. I think if we could get more articles from staff, especially something that they're working on, or faculty that they're working on, I think it would be uh, so much better. It would get the student body to know what the faculty mm -hmm. is thinking or what type of uh, research they're doing and kind of in a even more informal way Get this. Get the student body and faculty involved. Um, I, 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 ha I highly encourage it. So um, 
all four faculty involvement. <laughs> My experience and probably the best faculty involvement I've seen was with my advisor, Dr. Brown. Um, Matt Upton also does a really great job too, uh, but I sit with Dr. Brown and he understands the space I'm working in with nonprofits. And, you know, he has so much experience working with board members, executives, um, to all the assistants. So those are the people I'm communicating with a lot with our partnerships. And he's just done such an amazing job in showing me how to approach these people in a professional manner and so it's really created uh, a life learning and professional development experience for me it's not just seen as a student organization this is really almost kind of preparing me for my career path and that's what i really have taken away from the faculty involvement i mean and staff has also done a wonderful job but dr brown really understands what this position's about and has tried to pull all the great things out of me and he's also you know called me out on a lot of things um, <laughs> things I need to improve on but that's what I need and that's what I really um, appreciate from faculty well we had a really good balance uh, Dr. Cerami is our faculty advisor and he was really hands-off he would give us to pull on the reins if we were really going down the wrong path but generally he was he just made, let us make our own choices uh, and learn from them and then uh, Holly of course helped us with a lot of leadership yes. techniques and a lot of emotional support uh, <laughs> a lot of emotional support and uh, so that was sort of the logistics like, behind the scenes but as far as faculty support for our mission and for what we were trying to do it was unimaginable it was wonderful we had so much uh, interest from the faculty and uh, we even had faculty attend some of our trivia events mm -hmm. for fundraising and uh, a lot of faculty did come to our uh, our events this uh, semester and last semester so I thought we have a really I think we have a really good balance here at the <coughs> school of faculty and staff helping but not uh, not helping too much yeah. we just had a couple things to say I cannot say enough about Holly and Matt. I mean, they're just like mm -hmm. gods among mere mortals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they have helped our organization specifically as our faculty advisors just kind of, like I was talking earlier about how we don't really have our form yet or, or, or slowly taking our form and they've helped us um, facilitate that in a really nice way uh, to where we can balance a lot of different things together. Um, ours is a little different with faculty involvement. I mean, we work with Scope Rock with the Moss Bacher Institute and um, the Bush Foundation. So we're dealing with Professor Nazios and Colonel Bailey and Dr. Taylor and um, Fred McClure with the foundation, things like that. Um, the thing I would love to see for faculty involvement is to really, the speakers that we do bring here, Scowcroft, Mossbacher, Bush Foundation, Conquer Phillips Lecture Series, whatever it is, to then incorporate that into the classroom. Because um, we have, sometimes what we'll do is, is we'll, we'll represent the school at an event and we'll have a lot of cool interaction with people um, and really intriguing things, but then we'll kind of talk about that in reference to some of our research maybe, or um, if we had General Scowcroft come, or David Ashcroft come, or you know Kathleen Bertini, and how that relates to development or national security or nonprofit manager or whatever it is. So I think I, I enjoyed the faculty involvement in those speakers, but incorporating that back into the classroom when we have such distinguished guests come to the school, um, I think might help out just a little bit more in terms of making it more relatable to topics that they share um, when they come to the school. So. It's a good point, and I would think that the ambassadors are, <coughs> are uniquely positioned since uh, you get drug into virtually every speaking event that uh, 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 the school or the foundation puts on uh, to, um, uh, you know, just, just to flag um, a speaker that you think would be particularly effective in the classroom. Um, um, that, that is probably one where we would follow, uh, again, your lead, uh, and uh, really for all of you, um, uh, that are are involved in uh, uh, some of our outside events. It's a good point. Um, you carry great responsibilities uh, as leaders. Um, um, you work ha hard at it, uh, but uh, I hope it's not all pure work. And so, tell me. In your, your experience as leaders, uh, what, what was the most fun thing uh, <laughs> that you did? You know, oh, I have a list. <laughs> oh, I was like, I have a list, uh, but if I had to choose two, it's definitely 
uh, leading the meetings and trying to encourage the people that attend, I was trying to pull out some like motivational YouTube videos and like try to get people interested <laughs> in service and really what it's about, but show all the aspects of service. It's not just volunteering your time, but it's you know just reflecting on the experience and people that your lives are changing. So I would try to do that. So that was one of the one things I probably really enjoyed. And then it was just going to the events and seeing all the hard work that my project lead and assistant project leads did because it was like again I mean I let them I just delegate and say hey this is your project like take it on and run with it I mean we're here to support you with the resources and you know I'll communicate um, to everybody you know that the events going on but whenever I went to the event and saw how successful they were and how they were bringing people and how creative they got in the programming um, it was really amazing to see that people are just so passionate about what I'm also passionate about. I think my favorite part was uh, getting a lot of compliments on the website. Uh, we finally got an awesome website going for the public servant, which is gvspublicservant.com. <laughs> uh, John Malusi, who is all the almighty cyber guy, actually put this website together. And when we came back after the summer, there was so much fantastic content on it that I was just so proud to be the editor-in-chief of the public servant because it is one of those things that all the content that is on there will be on there for as long as that website keeps going because we are using great technology that we can now tap into for free and so I think that has been the most funnest part and also getting to know my staff really well because all of the staff members are so hardworking and they they put as much into it as they can and try to produce some really really great content so it's, it's been really refreshing to, to meet some great people <laughs> yeah, on a similar note just seeing all the hard work pay off not only for us at events um, but also just the feedback that we've gotten from Aaron Friedberg from Princeton in particular he was amazed he'd never he's one of the found co-founders of National Alexander Hamilton Society and he'd never spoken at an event that had an audience as large as the one we put together Wow! and so just being able to see that and hear from the you know the people at National that were ranked you know fifth in the nation of all the over 50 chapters after only a semester it was really gratifying and then being able to work with such great people to accomplish that and everybody gets that little I know Amber and I are both pretty competitive, so we get that little <laughs> release <laughs> from accomplishing those things, but also it's the Bush School name again, so we're, we're really helping uh, put that out there in a really positive light, which I really enjoy and feel a lot of gratification from. I guess the biggest thing um, for me, and, and SJ president is sort of unique because it's the only position that you know, elected by the entire student body. I essay first year, second year. It's not chosen by a committee or a panel or anything. You, you have to directly go forth and put a message to the students. And I guess the biggest, the, the part that's been the most fun for me is just seeing the tangible impact that we can have in students' lives. And, you know, just to give an example, uh, when I first came in to office, there was an inherent problem with our international students in terms of being able to acclimate to American scholastic culture and then just social culture in general. And then part of our efforts revolved around being more integrated with our diversity committee, setting up adequate structures so that we can partner them with students, so that we could be a resource for them to reach out and be more integrated. And I had, you know, the privilege to work with two great diversity committee chairs, Gabby and then Stephanie, who's here in the audience. And the work that we were able to do and that they specifically were able to do to, to help students and integrate them more, just the change that you saw. Hey, Naaman, you know, I was failing this class, but thanks to my English buddy and the help that they gave me, given, you know, helping me giving presentations, helping me adequately cite my sources while writing papers, it's completely changed the trajectory of my scholastic career and seeing not just a tangible impact that you've made, but a real life personal impact that you can make on student lives has been the part that's given me the most enjoyment. And another thing that makes the SGA president position unique is we operate on a calendar year, not a school year. Mm -hmm. So I've actually gotten the privilege to work with the second years 
in my first first part of my term and then next year I'll get the privilege of working with the new first years and so I've gotten to work with one one group already and I'll get to work with the completely different groups I think that's been a great part of this position is getting to work with these second years while they're still, while they're still here and then on top of that I would say I hope that the best is yet to come for me because I am only halfway through with my position so hopefully I'll have a different story next year <laughs> <laughs> You know, the most fun that I had was actually learning from uh, all of the first years uh, and the, a few second years that were involved. We were mostly had first years um, because I think that there were a lot of times where it seemed like I knew exactly what I was doing and had a complete handle on everything and they would just throw out ideas that were brilliant. And I've, you know, I've tried to keep up with thank you cards and to let these people know but there are a lot of a lot of you out here, and like y'all are great, and I learned so much from you, and so that was a lot of fun. Um, being surprised by um, you know sometimes you get tunnel vision, and someone comes completely out of left field, and you can't imagine doing it any other way, and it's just really nice to experience that. So for me, I mean, we had a fantastic year. Um, I, for the bachelor's room, we had an absolutely phenomenal year, and I tip my hat to all of them for their hard work, and we definitely had some fun events and some fun experiences, but. Compared to last year, um, the biggest thing I walk away with is nothing of my own doing. The fact that our organization was so committed to um, all these different events, we never really had too much of a trouble getting people to events. Um, we filled spots and were able to play really minimal background roles with still such respect and professionalism. And um, the ambassadors and I really had a chance to, um, like I said, play a lot of background roles in these in these events, and we never had a problem with commitment, and which is actually um, a, a problem last year towards the end of the spring semester for investors. And um, these these guys and girls really stepped up, and they really took it and made my job way easy. Um, and we had, a, we had a really high level of commitment from our organization. Um, you all have now had um, significant experience in leadership roles. Um, part of being a good leader is being self-aware, um, understanding who you are and what your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, as a result of the um, uh, process you have been through, how would you characterize your own leadership styles? I guess I'll go with that one first. <laughs> um, I would characterize my leadership style as decisive. And I would say that decisive does not necessarily have to denote being in a rush. But I try to find all the relevant information, operate under the best and most recent information possible, and then once I make a decision, you know, I go with it and try to really stick to what I believe I'm doing that's, that's specifically right. Um, and again, talking with Holly, I think that that's one of the things that I've experienced a lot of growth in because in order to be decisive, you, you really need to be comfortable with yourself because you cannot please everyone. You know? And when you try to, you end up pleasing no one. You have to make sure that you have your information, you have your logic set out, and that you can justify a particular decision after soliciting all the input you can. And so for me, that's probably the biggest learning that I've gained from my particular leadership style and development over this last year. Part of being self-aware is understanding your own weaknesses, and that's something I've had to come to terms with. And so I would characterize part of my leadership style as empowering and delegating because that's been huge for me one of the things that I've go to again and again for this is I haven't had much experience working with a budget and so when it came to SGA's budget which has been a problem for years and years past <laughs> is how, how we're gonna effectively manage this budget I knew I had to go with somebody who knew what they were doing because I didn't know what I was doing and so I went out and I found an accountant within the Bush <laughs> best decision I've made and it's worked out extremely well we're so far we've restructured the budget, done so much already just in one semester, and one of the things I want to leave next year, one of my goals is I want to have a budget that's sustainable and it's institutionalized and it works. And so one of the things I did is I had to realize that I didn't know what I was doing. And so I had to find somebody who did know what they were doing. And so yeah, I would say delegation and empowering other people to help you out. I think my leadership strengths were adaptability and influence. I was able to 
build kind of a network of people that I knew I could tap into if I needed articles. Like, hey, I really need an article from you. I need a real, I really need an article from you. But when members started kind of dropping off, I was able to adapt through certain situations, especially with the help of a lot of the team members, especially Robbie and Jessica Parker, were very, very helpful in making sure that things went very smoothly in a couple of the first years. Uh, and I will say this, you, you really have to understand what your weaknesses are. And I think my one of my weaknesses was that I didn't exec and execute a plan in the beginning, and that really hurt the process. But being able to adapt to the situation really helped kind of get get through the whole motion of the year. And now we're we're towards the end, and it's 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 been a really good learning experience. Um, it's difficult. Uh, so this year we definitely went through a pretty big transition with PSO so when I had to reflect on my leadership style I realized that I was trying to be a strong communicator and transparent in that way I was communicating because there was a lot of changes happening um, so I had to communicate a lot with my advisors and uh, my exec team and then I also tried to be creative and I, I, that's definitely I would say one of my strengths um, as a person and I try to figure out ways that uh, we can create change and that we're also being decisive and taking in other people's ideas and opinions but in the end what I one of my learning experiences as a leader is that the decision falls on you and if you're gonna follow through with it you just have to say yes and go and um, that was a little difficult at first and then I realized oh yeah nope, it's I say yay or nay in the end and that's how we move forward uh, and it is a different structure I think um, than you know SGA who has you know you guys vote on different things so it was diff different to see yeah, how other organizations do it and then how, oh, this is how we're supposed to do it. Uh, and that let me you know, be more aware of, okay, this is how I'm gonna be a decision maker and a communicator at the school. I think for me, um, I'm a big metaphor guy. So anybody who knows me knows I speak in metaphor. So it's, I follow it, it sounds weird. But um, <laughs> in undergrad, I was at a conference one time and they asked me to think about how, how I view life, like a game to be won. Uh, uh, a puzzle to be figured out, and I chose this other metaphor, which is like a garden to be cultivated. And I feel like my leadership style plays into that because every single opportunity, and I hope I portray this to my bachelor's as well, uh, if I didn't, please tell me, um, <laughs> this well, is that every single time that we have our jackets on is an other opportunity to add value to 41's legacy. And to create an atmosphere or a garden to be able to cultivate that spirit um, was something that I tried to impress upon, knowing my weaknesses of impatience and not liking authority and not liking to work in groups and all that stuff. That's not important. But, uh, <laughs> no, acknowledging those weaknesses. Uh, yeah, acknowledging those weaknesses, but trying to create an atmosphere where our organization seeks to add value in the smallest and largest senses every single time um, we step out on the floor. Um, to where you are constantly in an added value mindset as a leader. Um, and also to know that every single ambassador is a leader themselves, just like every member of SGA and every member of Alexander Hamilton and PSO and, and uh, Public Sturdiness as well. And they're a leader in their own right, for them to know that and to, to hone that in. Well, there are a lot of other leaders here, or certainly people with views on leadership. Um, I'd like to turn to the uh, the audience for any questions or comments that any of you might have uh, for our distinguished panel here. Yeah. What can members of this, the Bush School student body that don't hold the, these executive positions that you guys uh, hold, what can we do to make the organization run better? What can we do to make your jobs easier and experience better for both of us? Participate as much as you can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say you know, there is a lot of back end work that we have to do, and I may be closed off in my office a lot of the time, so it's difficult, you know, to kind of hear what you guys want to do. So I want people to feel comfortable to come to me. Like, please just come and have a conversation and say, I would love to partner with this organization. And I did have some of that this year, uh, and this is why we, you know, we've kind of instilled some systems for next year on adding new programs um, and events and partnerships. So, but it's nice to know like what you actually want to do uh, and who you want to um, support in the Bryan College Station community. So, come to us. For me, it's creativity. Um, there were, a, you know, especially when you don't necessarily have a titled position, you might just sit and wait and like tell me what I can do to help you. No, think about what you can do to help. 
And like we have to do that as well. As a leader, you have to think about what you have to do for your organization, and you have to do it or find someone to do it. Um, but there were a lot of times where I heard suggestions through the grapevine from some of my uh, some from our members, and you know I wanted to be like, well, I wish you would come to me with that. And that was a really creative solution to a problem that we've solved now. But that would have actually been a better way to do it. And so being creative and being confident and knowing that you have something to offer to the student organization uh, or any organization that you're involved with ever. Uh, I, I know I wish, I, I really wish some of that had come to light um, sooner. I would echo what Amber said, seek opportunities to improve the organization that we may not have access to. Because each and every one of you have access to a different group of people, a different group of Bush School students that I don't have access to. So go out and seek your own methods of solving problems that problems that I may need not even be aware that exist, and then come to me. Like like Amber said, we I don't know it's a problem unless people tell me it's a problem. And so go out and do do these things on your own, and then bring it to us, and you know you you get all the credit. I, I will happily say that you know it, it was all y'all because there there are times when I'm just not aware of issues, and so bring it to us always and do the best you can to get us the most information you can. I think that's the beauty of all Bush School organizations. There's so much room for growth that anything that you bring to the table will be so appreciated that, you know, you should just go, if you really feel like the Bush School needs something or any organization is, is lacking something fundamental or that you have a suggestion, do not hesitate to go to any student leader because they will appreciate your, your concern or your criticism more than and they'll be like, oh my god, why is, why is he even saying that? Yeah, that's, man, that's a good question. Um, there's a tendency of Bushnell students to think after your two-year program ends, and that only be your mindset. Um, and from my perspective, there's always going to be another job, another chapter of your life, another thing to do. So think about adding value to the walls which you're in right now before adding value to your next job outside the Bushnell. And so what I would say that just students in general is, um, I mean, the ambassadors are starting just from people wanting to add value, and it's a student-run, student-created organization. And for, in the ambassadors, for example, we just want more students at events. Like, we want more students to experience these awesome speakers we have. And so add value to your experience while you're here, and, and have, you, have the personality to want to self-initiate yourself here and, and find creativity here that Amber was talking about before you, you worry about your job afterwards and your internship. I promise you those things will come. I promise it's gonna be okay. Add value <laughs> to your hallways here by going to events, by participating out in Hamilton, by coming to SJ meetings, by writing things for public for a public servant, by participating in service projects for PSO before you think about internships and jobs. Because there's always going to be something after that you can add value to, always. And so I would think to tweak your question a little bit is what can you do for yourself? Also keeping us Grounded. Don't let us get up in the clouds and think that we're detached because we're some <laughs> student leader thing. That's not. They're uh, <laughs> making, making bees like y'all. So <laughs> it's just uh, to keep us grounded. Well. Um, I'd like to make a comment and pose a question based on something Gabby said earlier. Since I'm one of the guards for the communications office upstairs, I know Gabby mentioned that there is some navigation to be had as a leader between the relationships of staff and administration and the role that those kind of entities can play in helping student leaders. And one thing I found in my guard position is that I kind of operated in a formal sense. I was I'm a part of SGA and a part of um, the public servant and PSO, I guess. But I also work with everyone I'm on a regular basis, whether it's asking me for quotes or for information about your uh, events that I could use in articles or participating in things. I was kind of in this unique position. And so I really appreciate all of you texting me randomly or emailing me back instantly with all these different random requests I had because I view that I kind of play this liaison role and so did uh, my counterpart or see to the communications office to externally promote the most what we do. So I guess in the future, do y'all have any feedback for how specifically communication could work better? Because I know that's something that I can speak confidently for my whole office that this is something we want to continue to improve upon uh, and move forward, and also just thank you all um, for always helping me out with my bar work because it helps to make the Bush School look good and that's what we're all about. I would say like just what you just did there, uh, that's exactly what we need uh, to understand what is your role and their role. And if you are going to be playing that liaison, let us all know. That's what I think was the difficulty was I was trying to navigate 
um, <clears throat> how to communicate with them because yes I was approached by you at times uh, I was also trying to get things on the TV screen so I had a direct relationship with Stephanie Taylor and so um, maybe something would be to have when we begin we we're talking about doing these round tables some sort of um, resources introduction of the Bush School and what's all available <laughs> to all of us who are the outlets we're supposed to get to because that also leads to the efficiency and that's something where I you know already complained about all the emails and so if we could somehow go ahead and say this is Robbie's role she's gonna be the liaison the go-to or only Stephanie Taylor for these things um, that's something I had to navigate in the beginning but I'm definitely gonna pass that on uh, to my successor I think something that would be really interesting would be as first years when we come in we go through orientation I think as leaders a leadership orientation would be something that would be beneficial for all leaders because one we will get to have a relationship with each other mm -hmm. and also the administration and understand what it is that we have to work with and what type of limitations we have as well as what type of resources we have so I, I think that's a, that's a great idea well I think we have pretty well run the clock um, as the uh, 41st president of the United States once said um, public service is a noble calling um, <laughs> You personify that. Thank you for some excellent presentations and for first-rate leadership that does the school credit. Thank you.